in North America, it's hard to um, measure how many people are actually suffer from chronic pain, which is defined as pain uh, which lasts more than six months and is usually ongoing for many years. But it's around one in five. If physicians can't find the source or alleviate it um, during a certain amount of time, it becomes an, um, pretty much irreversible. So it's a very slow decline and people become less mobile and um, generally more socially isolated. I've had chronic pain for 23 years. When I started my career as a researcher, um, I thought, okay, so what if you could walk into a multimedia application? And that was the fir around the first time that um, immersive virtual reality was used for, by artists. And the Banff Center for the Arts um, funded six groups of international artists to create immersive virtual environments. And um, I worked with a choreographer, Yakov Schreer, and our immersive virtual reality project was taken using an MRI data set of uh, my torso. And um, so the environment you were in had no rectilinear references at all. And you felt like you were in this torso with big ribs coming around you and so forth. And the ribs moved and um, the surfaces of organs and things were texture mapped, so when you touched them, it had collision detection, um, the text would change. When you went into organs and you were expecting an enclosed space, you got a surrealistic kind of very open space, and it was very easy to get lost, so we had spatialized sound um, as a way to navigate um, to find your way back. And because it had no rectilinear references, um, one's proprioceptive sense, or uh, the way you feel like you are in your body, so for example, what enables you to touch your nose when your eyes are closed, um, that was activated in a very different way that felt to me like the meditation I was doing to alleviate my own chronic pain. So, the, the experience of the immersive virtual reality and my own uh, kind of ways to manage chronic pain came together in that project. I was um, teaching at the University of Washington in Seattle and working at the Human Interface Technology Lab or the HIT Lab there. And um, that's a prominent um, virtual reality lab. And Hunter Hoffman was using immersive VR for patients who experienced um, third degree burns. And the most acutely painful time um, in recovery is when they had to abrade the wound or s scrub it when they changed bandages. And in their studies, they found that immersive virtual reality is more effective than opiates. With us. So the question then was, well, is it the immersive aspect of VR or could video games on a screen achieve the same thing. And while video games on screen had some effect, it wasn't as, as um, steep an effect as um, um, the immersive virtual reality. Um, so in addition to using immersive virtual reality um, to alleviate chronic pain or its use as a non-opioid analgesic, um, I'm also looking at using it for social computing. We have several projects. One is the meditation chamber, and that's at use in um, 20 hospitals and clinics around the world. And uh, it's at uh, a virtual reality clinic in based in Atlanta called Virtually Better. Now we're working on another project called walking meditation, and that involves a treadmill and walking through landscapes. You could say, well, meditation, nobody really needs to use technology to meditate. Mm -hmm. But what we found in um, studying over um, 500 people is that the advantage is it gives people who are new to meditation real-time feedback so that they can learn to meditate um, and feel more confident about doing that. So we combine the immersive virtual reality technology with the biofeedback device 
and in this case a treadmill and so that um, will hopefully help with mobility issues and um, giving people a sense of, of um, not strictly um, sitting and meditating but being more active while they're doing it. Mm -hmm. We're complementing that with using iPhones and other kinds of smart mobile devices to uh, reinforce the learning of the meditation to begin with. And then a third project is called It Hurts Here. So It Hurts Here is a way to visualize for people um, where it hurts, how it hurts, is it stabbing, is it piercing, is it throbbing, is it burning, is it tingling? And that was inspired by um, my own experience. It took me about 12 years to get diagnosed. And the diagnosis came finally when I took Sharpie markers and drew on my own body <laughs> and said, it hurts here and it hurts like this and it goes here and it changes like this. And I did some visualizations over time. And that really enabled the physician to make the diagnosis that had been so frustrating. So we're uh, pursuing this from uh, an angle of teamwork that includes a designer, an artist, a physician, a computer scientist, and um, many people who suffer from chronic pain. Uh, one of the projects I did at, at Georgia Tech um, with Larry Hodges, who's a computer scientist, was um, a game that we very much defined as a game because it was for 10-year-olds who suffered from cancer and were getting chemotherapy. Now the chemotherapy treatment is, um, they, they had a kind of a bag implanted, if you will, and they would have to get infusions every week or every so often. And those infusions were acutely painful. Mm. Um, so to distract them, we said, okay, how can we build an immersive virtual environment? We decided that we very much wanted a game because it was appropriate for 10-year-olds and um, the idea was again how do we keep their attention so they were in a water world and um, they at first saw their avatar um, and they could choose which kind of fish like creature they wanted to be and then they would swim in a river and um, the the object of the game was there was an evil octopus and the octopus um, formed a kind of jail and the jail had um, the user's friends and family held hostage. <laughs> the user would um, go down the river and either get worms or um, uh, explore other things um, and get points to get them to the octopus so as soon as they could and then with enough points they could free their friends and family. Some of the environments that they could explore were um, you know, a pirate ship that had gone down and had treasure, and another one was a cave, but it wasn't clear which were the caves and which were open mouths of very large fish. <laughs> there was a lot of discussion about, is that too frightening for kids and so forth, but what we found is it wasn't frightening for them at all. They were really excited by that. Mm -hmm.